Back when high-speed internet meant 0.056 megabits per second download speed. I have some old-school telephone line modems, 14.4K, 33.6K, and 56K bits per second. The 14.4 doesn't work, or at least I can't make it work yet, so I want to get the other two talking to each other without an actual phone line. I have this early 2000s computer that's running Windows Millennium Edition, but I have a boot disk to get me into DOS. Let's power this up. So the 56K modem is plugged into this computer with an RS-232 port on the back. The 33.6K modem is connected to this mid-2000s PC running Linux Mint right now, and it does not have an RS-232 port. So I'm using this USB to RS-232 to plug in that modem. So aside from being plugged into the AC adapter and the RS-232 on two separate computers, there's a phone cable coming out of each modem, coming to an old-fashioned wall phone jack, and I have those wired directly to each other. But it won't work just like this. So there's the back of the modem. You plug a phone cord into the wall, you can plug another phone in here, then you have configuration dip switches, the RS-232 port, and the AC adapter. All those dip switches can be configured like this. It looks like we've booted up on the 56K modem computer in DOS, and I have a separate keyboard for each computer, so I'm going to have to manually type commands into each modem this way. So with the modems on the workbench connected to the computers, I also have a couple of monitors set up on adjustable arms. This would be the early 2000s PC running DOS. We just booted up from the floppy. So that's going to run the 56K modem, and I'm going to use a program called Telex that I used to use in the 90s. The other monitor is on Linux on the mid-2000s computer, and it's running Minicom. So we can take a look at the settings there. And I have a current meter set up so that we can see that at the same time and see how much current the phone line uses when we get one set up. First, I need to take this keyboard and get over to Telex. I never realized all this time this Telex Exis company has a P.O. box back in the day, West Hill, Ontario, Canada a phone number, a fax number, and a bulletin board system that has a 14.4 modem, like this. So it goes in, initializes the modem. Part of what I want to do here with this experiment is document everything I had to configure as well as the hardware circuit for using the phone line. I already spent hours messing around with this. There's modem initialization commands and internal NV RAM settings and factory defaults. I need to do a more research on how all the settings work on these dip switches as well as what modem AT commands I can use to configure all this. But as these devices are right now, as far as the dip switches, because I did have to set them differently and I did have to play around with everything, the 33.6K modem has these dip switch configurations. The 56K modem has these dip switch configurations. The difference being switch 7 is up on the 56K, down on the 33.6K. So it's a matter of are we or are we not loading stored settings or factory defaults. So if I ever get stuck in the future after playing around with this, I can at least revert back to these settings and go from there. So on the 56K modem running Telex in DOS, this is the initialization string that I'm using right now, which works. If I go in and look at other settings, I really need like three cameras here. So I set the modem to be 38.4. Again, just experimenting. The fastest I can connect right now is 33.6 because I have a 56K and a 33.6K, so the slower one wins. And there's no 33.6 setting in here, so I had to go with 38.4. N81, the usual parity, stop bits, data length. My terminal emulation is ANSI. I have local echo on and carriage return line feeds so that I can get down to the next line when pressing enter and I can see what I'm typing. So that's about the only important stuff there. There's my modem initialization string. ATZ will reset the modem. 
and then I configure it with ATS 7 equals 55, S0 equals 0, V1, X4. I'd have to look these up. I think S7 equals 55 has something to do with dialings. S0 equals 0, I think that says don't auto answer on any amount of rings. Now looking at Linux Minicom on the 33.6K modem. Communication parameters, so we are set to 38.4 as well, and 8N1, also using ANSI for terminal emulation. And the serial device is the USB to serial cable with just the phone cables basically plugged directly modem to modem and nothing else. If I try to answer the phone line with ATA, the characters are doubled up because I have local echo on. When I hit enter to try to answer the phone line, normally it should start squealing and trying to connect, but it just says no carrier because there's no phone line, there's nothing there. Over on the telex side, if I do the same, ATA, it's not doing anything, it's not making any noise, and no carrier. Looking at how the plain old telephone service works, i.e. landlines, we can figure out what we need to do to emulate this service without a real telephone service to get a couple of phones or modems working together. There's a lot of resources out there, but this one pretty much sums it up nicely, so let's skim through the first part of this. I'll put links to information below. Here's a little block diagram they have. So they have subscriber terminal equipment, which would be a phone or a modem or whatever else you plug into the phone line. Then you have the actual wiring between your location and the telephone central office. And then there's the central office itself, which handles giving you the voltage and current sources providing the service, giving you your dial tones, detecting the buttons you press, and connecting your call. All we're trying to do today is figure out the part of all of this where we give power to our modem and get it working. So the customer is usually a couple of kilometers away from the central office, and in the central office, when the phone is on hook, so it's not picked up, there's about minus 48 volts DC present on the phone line when it's idle. This is basically set up as a current source with some resistance here, a couple hundred ohms in the phone line, and in the telephone equipment, the modem or whatever, there's another couple of hundred ohms here. But when everything is on hook, sitting idle, this has to have a high impedance, several megs minimum. Basically, it looks like an open circuit. So when the device plugged into the phone line is wanting to pick up the phone, there's a hook switch that closes, putting a couple hundred ohms across the phone line, completing the circuit path, and then you get maybe on average 20 or so milliamps of loop current established. We're not looking at everything like ring generating and detecting and audio in and out of the phone and all the touch tone stuff. We're just looking how to make the phone circuit live. So that's the problem we're trying to solve so that we can actually have two modems hooked up. Here's a simplified block diagram just for what we are looking at. We have our modem ready to complete the circuit on the phone wires, adding a resistance and expecting some sort of current. We need to provide 20 milliamps somehow into this phone path. And the simplest form of a current source is a voltage source like a battery and a series resistor. I've seen several circuits for doing this. Some of them use a 9-volt battery and series resistor in line with either of the phone wires. And sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't see an extra capacitor bypassing this DC current source, presumably to allow audio signals, which are AC, to still pass through. I haven't really played around with this solution. The other circuit I've seen, which I did try, it's the same voltage source and series current limit resistor, but they are connected in parallel across the phone line, and otherwise the two phones or modems that are being connected together are just wired straight through, and then when either of them want to pick up the phone line, they have an automatic current source. For now, I'm really just lightly experimenting, so I'm using a resistor breakout box so I can just choose different resistors until it works. I'm also not using the freshest battery. And also, depending how these two modems are each connecting up to the phone line, 
whether they're using resistors or some other sort of circuit to complete this path, all of this is going to interact and with this resistor, we may need to tweak it until we have enough current. So if we roughly say we're using a nine volt battery and we're trying to make sure we can get 20 milliamps of current, we could start with a 450 ohm resistor, but realistically it's going to need to be less than this because of the other impedances or resistances on the phone circuit. So in my case, starting from here and then gradually lowering this, I actually had to lower it down to about 150 ohms to get about 18 milliamps resulting on my modem connection. So I'll need to study this whole thing a little more, but for now I just wanted to do a feasibility study and see that I could even get this going. I'll be working on this more in the future, but for now it's just a quick bench test. Here's my makeshift telephone central office. I have a 9 volt battery taped to the end of the desk, as you do. A couple of alligator clips and I'm using the ever handy resistor breakout board to get a couple of hundred ohms in series with the 9 volt and then I have the current meter in series with this. So that gives me a little current source and when I put this on the phone line hoping to get around 20 milliamps or so available now when these modems are trying to dial out or answer a call, they can sense a loop current from the central office and continue on with their behavior. I'm going to try dialing from Linux, so ATD, but I'm not pressing enter yet, and then on Telex, ATA to answer. So I'll press enter around the same time and see if they can connect. Success! Okay, I've connected at 33.6, which is our maximum speed based on these two modems. Both sides confirm the connection, and we're using 19 milliamps between the two modems on our phone line. So I will type some stuff into the Linux side, and it should obviously come out over on the DOS side. Dial up modems in 2019. So it looks like we have a working connection. Switch keyboards. Now I'm on the DOS side, so I'll type something. I made a typo and I backspaced it over here, but it didn't clear it on this side. But otherwise, we have a working connection. Okay, so let me transfer a file from this DOS computer. If I remember correctly, page up brings up a menu. I'll have to readjust. So let's use Z modem, Z modem, whatever. I forget what I used to call it. Now, there's no file browsing on this. You gotta know the path and the file name. So it's in the current telex directory. So let's send telex.exe over to the Linux computer. Press enter. And our file transfer is underway. It says on both sides it's about 252k of a file size. And so far we've got about 70 something k, 80 something k. Oh, that was annoying. File transfer completed. This is going to be part of a bigger ongoing project. I'm just doing this for nostalgic sake. There's obviously not much practical use in getting modems up and running like this. So I'll continue figuring out all of the things I need to do to get these working and use them in different ways. But for now, as a quick test, all you need is a 9 volt battery, a couple hundred ohms to get you around 20 to 30 milliamps capable. Apply that across the phone line between two modems and we can use them. It goes without saying, we don't want to be plugging anything like this into a real active phone line. This is all offline on the workbench. So I'll be doing more retro computer stuff as well as modem stuff as time goes on. Maybe someday I'll even figure out what's wrong with this one. Maybe I just don't know how to configure it because my experience working with these two, at least today, they're acting very particular. I can only dial an answer in one direction right now. I'm not sure why. I'll have to research more about the initialization strings. There could be internal configurations stored in non-volatile memory that are impacting what I'm trying to do. The dip switches on the back have been a nightmare. Now I'm starting to document and I'll see what I can figure out. Keep an eye out for more content like this if you're interested in all this retro computing stuff.